Um, welcome everybody, I'm uh, Peter Foss, I'm CTO at Datamir. Um, Datamir is the uh, company that provides the world's first uh, analytics platform based on Hadoop. And um, I first want to give you some uh, background before I start with um, the analytics uh, results. And uh, first want to say that uh, it's a matter of fact that data is growing very rapidly. And it's even more that unstructured data is uh, growing much faster than structured data recently. And that's because everybody is using social media features, um, is uh, twittering, uploading videos, and uh, so forth. So unstructured data basically is everything human generated, um, commenting, uh, videos, and uh, those things. So that's a matter of fact, and uh, that certainly explains why everybody needs, needs scalable systems to process the data. Some other background is um, how was data processed uh, traditionally? And usually one was having an ETL process, which is very slow, slow in terms of setting it up. Um, the Data Warehousing Institute says that it usually takes um, three months to set up a data source in an ETL process. And what people do is they, they load their data in a static data warehouse um, environment, which is something like uh, Teradata, Oracle, uh, Greenplum, or something like that. And it's static because you always have to define a static schema. So it's, it's a database table with a fixed schema, and your data has to fit into that table. And after that, you want to do some useful stuff with it. You don't just want to collect your data, you want to do some analysis on the data. And uh, there also is a, a barrier to entry in actually doing that business intelligence uh, traditionally, because uh, to be able to do that, you need very good knowledge about how is the data stored in your data warehouse. So you have to know the table structures and uh, what, what indexes are available, what foreign keys, what does that Boolean flag mean, and things like that. Um, and the other problem that you're having with this is um, it takes uh, very long to set this up. Um, you have your data in a static environment, and you could do your business intelligence, but what if the situation changed? Um, today you might do some, um, some uh, click-through rates uh, analysis to your uh, websites, and tomorrow you want to do con uh, want to get some information about conversion rates. And uh, what you usually have to do, you want to do something completely new in the business intelligence side. That means that you have to adjust your static data warehouse. You have to, have to add columns to your table. You have to migrate all the data. But that's not enough. You also have to change the ETL process to get the data into the new format. So you have to invest a lot of human capital to do that. On the other hand, we have, uh, so that's the traditional uh, workflow. On the other hand, we have Hadoop. Um, Hadoop has a very fast uh, raw load um, process uh, to load data into the Hadoop environment. And that's because you're able to just load the data onto Hadoop as is. You don't have to transform the data first and um, convert it into a static structure. Hadoop itself is dynamic. And I'm not talking about scaling Hadoop. I'm talking about um, being able to make changes, because Hadoop doesn't have a schema. It just allows you to put any kind of data onto the cluster. It doesn't require you to um, create tables first and uh, stuck to that structure. And, and if you want to do analysis on Hadoop, you could just do that in a very agile way, because Hadoop comes with a very dynamic data processing uh, pipeline capability with MapReduce. So you could basically just grab anything from your data, convert it, and um, answer any kind of questions that you want to answer. And for example, you could use uh, cascading as a programming framework that is, um, makes it very easy to set up those uh, processing pipes. Um, Datamere would be another solution. Um, if you don't want to program, if you just want to use a web application that, uh, where you can kind of um, click together your analysis. And, um, 
But that's, that's the main uh, point, the main difference, uh, what you can do with Hadoop and why it's uh, more flexible than the traditional way. Another interesting uh, fun fact actually is that uh, some very smart guys have uh, spent the last six years and more to develop that wonderful NoSQL Hadoop platform that gives you all the dynamics of processing any kind of data. And what's happening now? Now we have Hive, and Hive adds SQL on top of that. Uh, that's ridiculous, actually, because um, which, that actually means we are now able to do the same stuff that we were able to do 30 years ago. So why would you develop a NoSQL platform and then put SQL on top of that? If you've ever, um, if you've not yet seen an elephant crying, that's actually when you install Hive on your system. Um, putting that in other words, it's a kind of evolution backwards. In uh, 1970, everything started with SQL. Uh, then it became um, the SQL standard, and people realized we don't want to deal with SQL that much anymore. So we uh, developed, uh, they developed ORM, uh, which also became a standard JDO. And uh, after that, they uh, people realized we have to be more flexible than that. Um, so all kind of no SQL uh, databases and uh, processing platforms uh, came up, including Hadoop. And at the very end, uh, we have Hive. And uh, so thank you. We are now able to do the same stuff again that we were able to do 30 years ago. And that's a kind of evolution backwards. Um, so just wanted to point this out. I know Hive is a pretty amazing project, but it's questionable if it's uh, the right development. If, um, if things are moving into the right direction, I would question it. Now let's talk about uh, what, what we have done for this presentation. And uh, we've actually used uh, Datamere here to just grab some structured and unstructured data um, and just get some insights into what's happening in the Hadoop world. Hadoop world, I mean uh, user group and uh, uh, committers. So what we've done, we've taken the commit logs from GitHub uh, GitHub um, is a mirror of the Hadoop SVN code repository. Uh, so it's about uh, one and a half gigabyte of log file. It's pretty much structured. And we have also just downloaded the um, user Hadoop user mailing list, which is um, also about one and a half gigabytes, just raw text data. Um, so we'll present some interesting results on this. Um, I would just like uh, to keep in mind that uh, data quality is always questionable because um, we're using pretty much unreliable sources. Emails, text can contain spelling mistakes, and also the Git log, uh, Git log uh, doesn't tell us everything. For example, if you ch change a line of code, Git would report this as one line added and one line removed. So uh, one always has to be careful uh, in taking the right conclusions out of this, but it's still uh, interesting what one can see. So I'm going to show you the results. We start uh, with, a, with a very simple analysis of um, just the commits that have happened per year, the number of commits. And one can see that in 2006, that is when the Hadoop project started as independent project, um, um, after that the commit rate was increasing and then going down in 2009 and 2010. Um, interesting what's happening here in 2011. Um, so we have a very high commit rate there. And um, who actually finds that this is special? Nobody? Who cares, actually? <laughs> okay, one, thank you. <laughs> um, so what, what's happening in 2011? So I've just done another uh, aggregation on the data, but this time not the number of commits, but the uh, lines of code, uh, green is added, red is uh, removed. And you can see that um, the kind of lines of code is increasing until 2009. In 2010, it's really going down. 
But then we have this huge thing in 2011 happening. It's uh, seven million lines of code changed. That's impossible. It's, um, it's really weird. And also, um, half of the bar is red and half of the bar is green, which means did they just delete all the code and rewrite the whole stuff? Probably not. Um, and that's what I mean. Uh, data quality is questionable. In 2011, what happened in the Hadoop uh, code base is that they just restructured the project. They uh, split the project into three main projects. It's Hadoop Common, Hadoop HDFS, and Hadoop MapReduce. And you can see this here. It's basically just uh, all these files changing their directories uh, pretty much shows up as everything has changed or everything has been removed and added again. So it doesn't really mean that there was uh, much other development effort going on. Um, now the first, um, now we are looking at most lines added by Jira ID. How do we get the Jira ID? It's certainly we just extracted from the subject because we didn't import any Jira data. Um, so uh, we can see that there is one Jira ticket. It's uh, Aaron Murphy with, um, I can't even read it, Hadoop 7560. And um, that's actually also one Jira that takes care of uh, making a POM module for Hadoop Common. So part of that Jira issue was just moving around a lot of code. That's why uh, the bars for added and removed are pretty much the same size. Uh, another one is uh, this Jira issue where a lot of lines of code were added. It's uh, 500 million, uh, 500,000 lines of code. It's really a lot for a developer to write. It's uh, probably some extra hours. Um, and not so many lines removed. So part of the project, uh, part of the Jira issue probably was uh, moving code, but also adding a lot of code. And that's uh, developing the uh, MapReduce 2.0 framework, which is also um, known as um, Hadoop Next Gen. Emails versus commits is the first time we join together structured and unstructured data. Um, and we have, um, we have done this here by um, hour of day. So you can see that's from 2006. Remember the good old days? Uh, developers got up at 1 p.m. or something like that, or 3 p.m., wrote their first email, and at about 4 p.m. they started committing code. Um, does it look strange? <laughs> uh, OK, thank you, time zone. That, that's all UTC, so uh, you're right. <laughs> um, so I'm not telling the truth here. Um, so actually, that's probably coming from the American time zone, and uh, that's probably early mornings in the East Coast, and that's early mornings in the West Coast, because Yahoo was uh, mainly developed at Yahoo, uh, which is West Coast, and uh, so that explains uh, what's happening here. 2011, totally different situation. So here are the emails, and here are the commits. So just talk, no work anymore. Isn't that great? Um, so it, it, it really shows that Hadoop has become a hot topic. Uh, a lot of people are talking about this, but not so many people are developing it. It doesn't mean that development has gone down. It just means that the ratio between emails and um, actual work is uh, uh, mess much less now. You can also see this in this uh, graph. You can see that um, email started at a reasonable rate, and now we have something like 800 to 1,000 emails uh, to the user mailing list per month, which is uh, really a lot of stuff to digest. Uh, who's actually following the Hadoop mailing list? OK, not, not so many. Who has stopped following uh, browsing the mailing list because of that? Okay, also some. <laughs> um, another interesting thing is, again, joining together structured, unstructured data. 
um, extracting the JIRA IDs from the emails and extracting the JIRA IDs from the Hadoop commit messages. And one could see that there are a couple of Hadoop JIRA issues where people just changed four lines of code, but before they did that, they exchanged 26 emails to do that. So again, that's much more talking than actually getting something done. And if you look at the kind of JIRA issues um, that are, that have that um, uh, relation, and all of them actually have more emails exchanged than lines of code uh, changed in the code base. And for example, the first one is about getting the native code compiled on Mac OS. And I can assume that a lot of people are writing that to the email list and really want to have that feature. And it takes some time to convince people to do that. And when they are convinced, they just change those four lines of code and it's done. Uh, the second one, I think, is a similar topic. It's about uh, getting it compiled on, um, I think, some Linux uh, Lenny distribution. There are a few people that really contribute most to the Hadoop um, mailing list, and it's uh, Harsh J and Ted Dunning, for example. Um, is anybody of these guys here? Ah, Ted, okay. <laughs> Hi. So uh, Ted actually is a real person. I wanted to make a joke, but I can't do that anymore because uh, I want to say Ted Dunning is uh, my three-year-old teddy bear, actually, is called Ted Dunning. And that's, sorry, <laughs> that's not just by coincidence. It's uh, because when I was browsing the Hadoop mailing list in 2008 and my, my wife was just looking at my computer, it's always Ted Dunning was appearing on the screen. So she just came up with this nice name for the teddy bear of the three-year-old son. Why, why isn't that called Harsh J, for example? Um, and that's um, actually a really simple explanation. Harsh J is just uh, the, the most active email writer since, uh, or for the last uh, almost two years. And I think he's also become a committer in September 2011, so it's also less than one year. But certainly it's, it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, this guy um, has written more than 1,000 emails to the mailing list since then. Um, I think, Ted, you're not writing that many emails anymore, right? Oop. So human resource department is also messing around with my slides, unfortunately. Um, another interesting question is, what are the most interesting uh, topics um, uh, in the mailing list? And uh, so the most replied emails are, for example, HBase with Hadoop seems to be interesting to people. Uh, also, risks of using Hadoop, it's also something which you could imagine, something you want to have uh, answered before you consider installing Hadoop. Uh, which release to use is certainly also something that I've questioned myself sometimes. Is it the latest one, or should I rather use an older release? Which one is the the most stable release, and sometimes it, it wasn't even the release that was in the stable download folder. So that, that's a valid question. Um, if you're an engineer, um, who's ever encountered something like this when using Hadoop? Yeah, that's quite some people, me too. Actually, that's also pretty common out of memory errors, and you find that on the uh, mailing list uh, pretty often. So what's the average characters per commit that people are using and um, uh, grouped by person? And there are a few guys that uh, take about 135 character, and that actually means how much space do you need, how much characters do you need to describe efficiently what you've done in your commit. And um, it's probably also one of the reasons why, why Twitter uses uh, 120 to 140 characters for their tweets. Uh, because people just need that space to express what they're actually doing. With some people, it's, it's different. They, they need 38,000 um, characters, and that's the commit messages. I think uh, probably here Aaron Murphy just maybe did that by mistake. He just put the whole article into that commit message and uh, 
just um, push that to the version control. That's my, my last slide, um, which I also found interesting. I've just uh, presented some results per UTC time, but I also summarized the, or aggregated the number of emails written by time zone, so which time zone is contributing most to the, um, to the user group. And uh, for example, um, uh, minus A to minus six, that's uh, um, United States. Uh, here at zero, that's uh, uh, pretty much United Kingdom. Here we are almost at the German time zone. This is India, and that's China. And uh, it's interesting that right now, America is losing a little bit. So uh, that's 2006, the blue one is 2008, and um, this one is 2010. So the, the ratio of, uh, in the United States going down, not so many emails are coming from the United States anymore. Um, India is increasing, uh, China is going down, and German time zone is going down as well. That doesn't mean that there is less interest, certainly. It just means that it, um, the, the traffic that comes from a time zone doesn't increase as much as it does in other time zones. And um, Right, so um, the only thing that comes into my mind is that maybe just Harsh J that does that? Not sure, but because he writes from the Indian time zone, from what I know. Um, so again, uh, data quality is questionable. Uh, how, how true is it actually? Uh, there, because there are a few guys that really write a lot of emails, and maybe one should do some other analytic, analytics as well uh, to kind of uh, get rid of uh, those uh, committers that answer a lot of questions. Um, and maybe one should just filter out all, um, um, all replies and just uh, count the questions. But that's some things um, that uh, you could do if you want to. Uh, just grab the data and do your analysis with Hadoop. Um, if you want to come to the Datamere booth, I can also show you a few things there. Uh, we can do that together. Um, and if you're interested in uh, what's going on, just follow us on Twitter. Thank you. Okay, okay it's time for questions now. Sorry. Right. Uh, are there any questions? I think we have time for two questions. Here's the first one. Did you, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you filter out the Jira from the email traffic? If, in other words, did you, do you have any graphs that have looked at what the, the actual users, um, user traffic looks like instead of all the Jira messages? The Jira messages are filtered out because uh, they're not going to the user's mailing list. That's uh, the dev mailing list. Um, so that's not included in this. Okay. Yes, just to use this. Uh, did you try to look at how, what the user sentiments were, like sentiment ana analysis over the text? Um, sorry, say that again? Like sentiment analysis over the text. Um, no, not really. Like, were people happy on the Hadoop mailing list, or angry, or...? <laughs> we actually try to extract some words that express happiness or angriness, but actually that wasn't very exciting to look at this. So we looked at some interesting words that didn't show up that much, so which is kind of good. Uh, it, it's, uh, it shows that the quality on the mailing list is, is pretty okay. But we actually wanted to make a funny slide with how often was uh, this strange word used, and it wasn't that exciting, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> or like smileys and things like that. It uh, didn't find too many. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.